All right, so welcome to the uh, Q&A video in regards to the topic of fluorescence. And in this video, we're going to see if maybe we can answer some questions that pertain to the material. Some are from past papers, or some is just a good representation of, of the material. So uh, by all means, let's get started. And I would, uh, let's get started with a few true or false questions. And this would be a really good time to pause this video and, and work on it on your own. So do so now. Perfect. So let's see if we can we can uh, make sense of uh, things around here. The Stokes shift, the Stokes shift, can be explained by the energy gain of the excited electrons. Now let's take a look at it. Really, the Stokes shift is the phenomenon by which we have some sort of a absorption spectrum that gets shifted towards uh, the redder the redder wavelength. So what I mean by that is that if if my absorption spectrum is this, and my emission spectrum is this and this is my wavelength, the x-axis is my wavelength, um, it seems that the uh, absorption spectrum is shifted towards longer wavelengths, towards longer wavelengths. And because wavelength is inversely proportional to frequency, that means that I have higher frequency here and lower frequency here. And this really means that we're losing frequency. We're losing frequency. And because frequency is proportional to energy, then we're losing energy. We're losing energy in the Stokes shift. So there's really no energy gain associated with the Stokes shift. So I would have to say that this would be incorrect. <coughs> and we're going to keep on going. Cash's rule gives us a relationship between an excited electron and non-radiated relaxation to the T1 triplet state. And just as a quick revision, if, if this is new to you, then you should probably review the videos uh, about, about fluorescence. But if, if these are my states, these are my states, Cash's rule, um, this is the triplet state, the triplet state. Cash's rule really says, if I have an electron that is excited here, it's going to rapidly, rapidly vibrate and rotate to the stable S1, or the first stable excited state. It doesn't really say anything about rotating and vibrating to the triplet state. So obviously this would be an incorrect state. Obviously this would be an incorrect statement. So I would have to say, I would have to say false, false. There you go. Once a fluorophore is excited, by light within its absorption spectrum, it would always yield light. It would always yield light. And we know that we have this parameter that we've discussed. It's called the quantum yield, the quantum yield, which is the number of photons, number of photons emitted over the number of photons, over the number of photons absorbed. And this would clue us in that different fluorophores emit some sort of energy. Uh, out of the energy that they absorb. What's important to understand is that the quantum yield is not go always going to be 100%. It's not always going to be six photons absorbed uh, and then six photons emitted. It can be six photons absorbed and only two are emitted. So it, it's not really possible for a fluorophore to always yield the same amount of light. And usually, uh, usually whenever in an exam I see uh, the uh, word always or never, I cannot think twice about things. So once a fluorophore is excited by light within its absorption spectrum, it will always yield light. That is false. That is not correct. Let's keep on going. <clears throat> the tripled state T1 is in a lower energy state or lower energy level than the excited state S1. It's really, this is a pretty simple comparison. If you remember the Oblonsky diagram, it looks something like this. Whereas this is the T1 state and this is the S1 state. So yes, the T1 is actually in a slightly lower, slightly lower energy state. So I would say this is correct. Very good. The higher the quantum yield for a given fluorophore, the less photons it may yield. And we're going to have to write this again, as I didn't even see it coming. I'll say number of photons emitted over number of photons, number of photons absorbed. So let's take a look at it now. The higher the quantum yield for a given fluorophore, the less photons it may yield. So let's just say, let's just say I had 10 photons absorbed, and let's just say I yielded eight, and we're going to take another instance where I only yielded two. Now let's, let's consider, the higher the quantum yield for a given fluorophore, the less photons it may yield. And you can see that this is a higher quantum yield, and it yields more photons. So if we say the higher the quantum yield, the less photons it may yield, it doesn't make any sense. It would yield more photons if the quantum yield is larger. So this would be false. A molecule whose, flu is, whose fluorescence quantum efficiency is 1, and this really means quantum yield, 
absorbs every photon it is exposed to? And this is kind of a trick, annoying question, but it's not too bad. It's not too bad because we can actually solve for what is a quantum yield of 1. The quantum yield of 1 is when these two expressions are the same. So let's just say 10 over 10, 10 over 10. And what does this mean? What does the quantum yield of 1 mean? It means that if I absorbed, if I absorbed 10 photons, I emitted 10 photons. So it's a relationship between the number of photons I absorbed and the number of photons I emitted. And this states that a molecule whose fluorescence quantum efficiency is 1 absorbs every photon as it, it is exposed to. <clears throat> well, I would have to say that a molecule whose quantum efficiency is 1 emits every photon it absorbs. It doesn't really, it doesn't really say anything here about how many photons it emitted. It doesn't give us this, this relationship. It only tells us it will absorb all the photons. And really, it's, it's not, it's an incomplete statement. It wouldn't give us, uh, it wouldn't give us this relationship. It only relates to the denominator. It doesn't say anything about the, uh, the um, numerator. And really, if I take a look at this, I can say that by this statement, I can have a molecule absorb 10 photons out of 10, and another molecule that absorbed also 10 photons out of 10. Just like this statement, it absorbs every photon as it, ex it is exposed to. But it, th this one can maybe uh, emit three, and this one can maybe emit uh, six. And in both cases, the quantum yield is not going to be one. So this would be false. I know it's kind of tricky, but maybe if you go through the explanation again, it would make more sense. And we're moving on with some fill in the blanks. And again, uh, do yourselves a solid and pause this video now to work to work on this material. All right, so let's get started. The internal conversion is a something something blank form of relaxation that can be obtained by vibration and rotation. This gives us a clue here. Well, fluorescence is a something da da da. Well, really, the only form of relaxation that we can categorize with vibration and rotation is a non non radiative relaxation. Non radiative relaxation. So the internal conversion is a non radiative relaxation that can be obtained by vibration and rotation. I agree. Very good. While fluorescence, and just by saying while, it means that obviously it has to contradict this statement. So while fluorescence is a well, this makes sense that it's a radiative form, a radiative because I'm getting photons. And by radiative, I mean, am I getting radiation? Am I getting photons? Non-radiative, I'm not getting photons. Radiative, I am getting photons. Very good. And we're going to keep on trucking. The radiative relaxation from the forbidden state, and this is the T1 state, is called something. While the radiative relaxation from the S1 state could be either something or something. And this really, I can't really use logic in this specific question because it's just based on knowledge. I know that whenever I have a radiated relaxation from the T1 state, it will always be phosphorescence. Phosphorescence. And this pertains from the S1 state, you would say, oh, you can radiate from the S1 state via fluorescence. Fluorescence. And you can wonder, what do you mean any other, any other form? What other form is there? And this is really, this really means delayed fluorescence, delayed fluorescence. And they're not really the same thing because in delayed fluorescence, first of all, just a reminder, these are the energy stages. This is the S1, uh, this is the S0, sorry, S1, T1. Whenever I go from here in a radiated form here, this would be phosphorescence. Whenever I go from here to a radiative, in a radiative relaxation here, it would be fluorescence. But if an, ele an, an electron is excited and then it goes to the triple state, and then maybe it goes back to the excited state and then it emitted a photon, this would be delayed fluorescence because effectively it took longer to emit that photon. Very good. Fret is highly dependent on something and cannot occur at distances greater than da 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 da. And this, this we really need to know. This is 2 to 10 nanometers. This is something that we just need to know. And what is Fret highly dependent on? Well, we know that Fret depends on distance and we know that Fret depends on uh, overlapping, overlapping of the uh, uh, em emission spectrum of the donor and the absorption spectrum of the acceptor. And we also need to have proper orientation. So the question is, what is it heavily dependent on? What is it highly dependent on? And it's dependent on the distance and the inverse sixth power. It is really, really, really dependent. So really, it is highly distance dependent, distance dependent. And this means that even if I'm within this range, even if I'm, let's just say, at a, at a 3 nanometer range, 
if I go to an 8 nanometer range, I would still be, be able to, 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 uh, to fret, but the efficiency is going to drop dramatically between these two. There you go. Let's keep going. The first filter incident light will encounter when entering a fluorescence microscope is the something filter, is the something filter. And really, when you think about it, if you don't remember this, you know that the first thing that needs to occur when, when exciting a fluorophore is that it needs to be excited in its absorption or excitation spectrum. So I need to take light and I need to turn it, <coughs> I need to turn it into, its, into the molecules of absorption spectrum or excitation spectrum. So this would be the excitation filter. And if you, if you mix it up and you write maybe uh, absorption filter, it, should, it wouldn't be incorrect, although I expect this word to be in your word bank. And if this, uh, this uh, is not really sitting well with you, maybe you want to review the video on the fluorescent microscope. Let's see what we have next. Let's see what we have next. The rate of photobleaching depends on the something and the duration of the excitation. And here, usually, often people say, OK, they gave me the duration. What am I going to do? I need something else. Maybe it's the frequency, because higher frequency is higher energy. But when you think about it, really, let's think about it. I have, so let's just say this is the absorption spectrum of a photon. This is the absorption spectrum of a photon. Of a photon. <laughs> this is the absorption spectrum of a fluorophore, sorry. So I can use these frequencies to excite the fluorophore. And OK, if I, if I apply this frequency, I get an excited fluorophore. And if I, if I up the frequency and I give it this frequency, I still excite the fluorophore. This is within the absorption spectrum. It's not going to demolish the molecule. I can absorb it anyway here, really. Or, I can, or rather, I can excite it anywhere in this wavelength. And if I give it a higher frequency, it's just not going to be able to absorb it. It's not necessarily going to destroy it. So really, what we're talking about is if I excite it, let's just say I excite it with with blue light, and these are just photons inside the, the uh, light ray. If I excite it with blue light, it may, be, it may be within its excitation spectrum, and it'll be OK. But it may cause photo bleaching if I excite it with a very intense, intense light, meaning that it's going to be very photon dense, very photon rich. And this may actually cause photo bleaching. So really, what I'm looking at here is the second, second factor would be the intensity. Intensity. So the rate of photobleaching depends on the intensity and the duration of the excitation, I agree. Let's try one relation analysis here. And again, please pause this video now if you want to work on this. It's always a good idea. Very good. Let's get started. In FRET, in FRET the photobleaching, this is supposed to be T, photobleaching rate of the acceptor will decrease because Let's just try this statement here. Let's just try this statement here. I have, I have fluorophore A and fluorophore B. And this is my donor and this is my acceptor. But we need to understand that energy is going to be transferred from the donor to the acceptor. That means that the donor is not going to deal with that energy so much. It's just going to bounce it off. So all the implications that come with absorbing this energy is going to be de decreased for the donor. Because imagine getting some sort of energy. It's just going to go, oh. I'm just going to move it over here. So it's kind of like if you're hitting it really hard with energy, maybe it'll just relay it later. So it's not going to be affected much by the different, different energies as much as the acceptor. So uh, let's just take a look at this. The photobleaching rate of the acceptor will decrease. So we're talking about the photobleaching rate of the acceptor. And when you think about it, the acceptor is now getting more energy. The acceptor is getting more energy, in fact, getting more energy than the donor. So the photobleaching rate really refers to how much the energy is affecting the acceptor. And the energy is going to accept the effector more. So the photobleaching the, the photo rate for the acceptor is going to rise. So in FRED, the photobleaching rate of the acceptor will increase. Will increase. This, if this doesn't resonate well with you, you probably need to go ahead and review the video about FRED. But this, this statement is not correct. And because in this process, the energy is transferred from the primarily excited molecule to the acceptor molecule. And actually, when you think about it, the second statement explains why the first statement is incorrect. Second statement explains why the first statement is incorrect. Because and the energy is transferred from the donor, the primarily excited molecule, to the acceptor. And that is why this guy is going to photo bleach more. Very good. So this is true. Hopefully, you found this helpful. And I'll see you in the next video.